Okay, so I think the recording has started. Uh, okay, so uh, maybe before we begin, some important announcements regarding the assignments, both one and two. So you guys might have received your grades for assignment one and grade scope, and also an email which says, what are the mistakes you should not do for assignment two? Please read those instructions uh, in the email uh, and follow that for assignment two. And regarding the regrading policy for assignment one, uh, so please remember that this is a class of 100 plus students and we have only five TAs and they are already overworking to, uh, to grade these individual assignments. Like all the assignments in the course are individual. So which means for every assignment, the TAs have to grade 100 plus assignments. So please don't email me or the TAs directly for regrading request. So you can only ask for regrading in grade scope and it's the regrading option is open until Friday 10 p.m. So you have only time until Friday 10 p.m. to ask for a regrade request and uh, that's it. So if, if, there, if there is anything else you want to explain to the TAs, use the Piazza to send a message to the instructors so that all the TAs can see your message. So if you have already sent me individual emails and you did not receive any reply from me, that basically means that I'm not going to reply uh, for individual emails regarding the assignment. So, so use grade scope and Piazza. So we need to have a scalable way of doing this for 100 plus students. Uh, so please use a grade scope. And also there are, I think, few students in the class who failed to submit your report in grade scope and you might have received zero. That's because you did not submit your report in grade scope. Uh, I think some of you have submitted your report in Moodle instead of grade scope. Uh, well, there cannot be any excuses because there was assignment zero, which explicitly meant, like which was explicitly set to help you in learning how to use grade scope. And the beginning of assignment one, like the instruction clearly says you have to submit your report to grade scope. So ideally you get a zero, uh, but just for the assignment one, I have asked the TAs to grade your submission in Moodle and uh, detect 20 percentage of your marks because you did not submit it in Moodle. Uh, but it is just for this assignment. Like if you are not submitting your report in grade scope for assignment two, it's a zero. So, so please follow the instructions. Um, and I think other than this, I also wanted to say another thing regarding assignments. Uh, yeah, so remember that like your report has to be complete. So there should be answer for every question. And if there is any question which asks you to generate a file or submit a file, just say that you have submitted that file and this is the file name. Um, so the TA who is going to grade your report is different from the TA who is checking your code. So you cannot expect the TA to run the code to know the answer. If the question asks for an answer, the answer should be in the report. Um, so please make sure that you do that for the second assignment. So we also kind of overworked to release the first assignment grades before we submit your second assignment so that the second assignment process is going to be smooth for everyone, both you and the TAs. Um, so yeah, I think uh, use this feedback uh, to make your second assignment better. Um, if there is any more questions about this, like I think we can do it in the end of the lecture. So let's begin. Let me share my screen. Okay, so yeah, so I think in the last lecture we discussed about logistic regression and then we also discussed about a Newton Raphson method for doing logistic regression and I was too greedy to start perceptrons uh, and I felt bad for that in the end. So we are going to restart from perceptrons. Okay, so we are going to look at discriminant based classifiers. Okay, so in the past, 
like we spent a lot of time on uh, learning about generative classifiers and discriminative classifiers, right? Like, so we're going to see few algorithms which uh, are, are under this umbrella of discriminant based classifiers. Okay, so we are going to start with what is known as the separating hyperplane method. Okay, so the basic idea in separating hyperplane method is to basically construct a linear decision boundary, a hyperplane dividing the classes. Okay, so we are interested in coming up with a linear decision boundary. Okay, that separates the data from two classes. Okay, so here is an example that we saw in the previous lecture, right? Like, so this is a two class problem. You have to separate uh, the red circles from green circles, right? And uh, the orange line is the solution that we could obtain with least squares or GDA. Like in this case, like they both give the same solution, okay? Now you can see that there is this one specific green circle, which is misclassified by least square, right? On the other hand, we see these two other separating hyperplanes, both blue and like both in blue color, right? And they have 100 percentage uh, like classification accuracy or zero percentage prediction error, right? So, okay, now we are looking for such hyperplanes which are going to divide, divide the data into uh, like, which is going to divide the classes uh, in, a, in a good way, right? Like, so, okay, now how do we do that? So I think we started with the first simplest possible algorithm to do that, which is the perceptron algorithm. Okay, so which was invented by Rosenblatt in 1958. Okay, so perceptron is a very simple model. It is going to look very much like logistic regression. Okay, so the model is y of x is equal to f of w transpose x. Okay, so a quick note, the bias is included in the x. So instead of writing W transpose X plus W zero, I'm just writing W transpose X. Okay, now this is my perceptron model, okay? Uh, where if you use F to be sigmoid, it's going to become a logistic regression model, right? Like on the other hand, perceptron uses a different function F, okay? The function F that is used by perceptron is the step function. So what is a step function? So it's basically plus one, if a is greater than or equal to zero, and it is minus one if a is less than zero. Okay, so now this is my classifier. Okay, now once you have the classifier, the next step is to coming up with an error function that you want to minimize by training this classifier, right? So now what error function can we use? And in this case, one natural choice of error function is basically total number of misclassified errors, okay? So how many misclassifications does this model have? And I want to minimize this misclassification, okay? So now we discussed in the previous, in the end of the previous lecture that this particular error function is notoriously difficult because this is a piecewise constant function of W with discontinuities wherever a change in W causes the decision boundary to move across one of the data points, right? So like a pictorial way of illustrating this is, let's say I have a bunch of crosses. Like this, okay, and a bunch of circles like this. Okay, so now if I start with, okay, I'm just going to artificially move these things like this so that I can use this illustration. Okay, so now if I start with a line like this to begin with, okay, let's just call this as the line during the first time step, okay? 
Now I will keep on moving this line so that I have 100 percentage accuracy or the misclassification is zero, okay? Now in this case, the misclassification is two, right? Then you keep on moving this. So you would move it slightly like this, slightly like this, slightly like this, okay? Now this is time step two, three, four, right? Then at some point you move it slightly like this. Now you cross the data point. So every time you cross a data point, the misclassification rate is going to change, right? So now at time step, before like starting from time step one to four, you had two errors. Now in the fifth time step, you have one error, okay? So now in the next time step, like if I do something like this, like if this is my six, then again, I cross the data point. So there's going to be a jump. So there is zero error, okay? So now you see that this particular misclassification count error function doesn't change at all if you are just moving your arrow, like, like decision boundary without touching any data points. So it changes only in like very sparse regions. Like whenever you cross a data point, this error function is changing, right? So this basically means that if you are going to use a method which uses the gradient of the error function, now the gradient of this error function is going to be zero throughout. And there will be a positive gradient just when you're jumping one data point. Then again, there will be zero gradient, right? So, so basically, you have zero gradient almost everywhere. And there is a positive gradient, like one, like, like, like a non-zero gradient only in certain places, right? So now this means that we cannot do gradient descent directly on this error function. Okay. So instead of doing gradient descent, Rosenblatt actually proposed a different way of training perceptron, okay? So to do that, first let us write the error function in a mathematical way. So perceptron error criteria, okay? So what do we want? So we want W such that, okay? If the data point X is in class C1, Okay, so then I want W transpose X of N to be greater than zero. Okay, similarly, if X of N is in class C2, then I want W transpose XN to be less than zero. Okay, now, as, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, like so in the case of perceptron, we are going to use minus one and plus one as classes instead of zero and one, okay? So T belongs to minus one and plus one, okay? Now I can actually combine these two things, okay? One and two can be combined as follows, okay? So for any Xn, I want W transpose Xn multiplied by T of N to be greater than zero. Okay, so if it is plus one, then I want W transpose Xn to be positive. If it is minus one, I want W transpose Xn to be negative so that the whole thing becomes greater than zero. Okay, now this is just a trick to combine these two if conditions in one equation. Okay, okay, so now, if a data point is correctly classified, Okay, so if a data point is correctly classified that this is satisfied, then I have zero error, right? On the other hand, if the data point is wrongly classified, okay, then what is my error? My error is going to be minus W transpose X of N, T of N. Okay, so if I minimize this, so, so this basically, like I want to minimize 
this error. Is that clear? Okay, so maybe just to give you an illustrative example, let's say the class is plus one. If the class is plus one, then I want my W transpose Xn to be greater than zero. Okay, on the other hand, if my answer is minus five, so if I multiply these two things, I get minus five, right? Like minus five is not greater than zero. So I want to minimize this error so that this whole thing becomes positive. Is that clear? Okay, so now I can actually write this thing as a single loss function now, finally. So perceptron criteria is given as EP of W, which is minus summation over N belonging to M, W transpose XN, T of N, where AM is basically the set of all misclassified examples. Okay, so now you can see that this is actually a slightly different error function than the error functions that we have seen so far. So what are the error functions we have seen so far? We have seen least squares, right? And we have seen negative log like Likert. In both these types of error functions, like you are going through all the examples and you are computing the error for all the examples, right? And like you are doing gradient descent with the gradient from that. Uh, on the other hand, with perceptron, if the example is correctly classified, it doesn't even participate in this error function, okay? So you, if you have 100 examples and only 10 of them are wrongly classified, then your error function is going to consider only those 10 wrongly classified examples, okay? So now the contribution to the error associated with a particular example, right? So the, con the contribution to the error associated with a particular misclassified example is basically a linear function of W in regions of W where the pattern is misclassified. Okay, and it is going to be zero in regions where it is correctly classified. So or in other words, this error function is actually a piecewise linear function. So this is still not a very difficult error function to minimize, okay? This is piecewise linear. So what you can do is you just take that one example which is strongly classified, you compute the gradient and try to minimize the error. Is that clear? Okay, so now so that means we can actually use stochastic gradient descent here. Okay, so how am I going to do that? So the W new is basically equal to W old, okay, minus eta times the gradient. Okay, so where eta is my step size or learning rate alpha, right? Like you can also call it as alpha. And this is the error with respect to just that, just that example. So now if you go back here, when you differentiate this function, the error is going to be um, I think there is a mistake in the notes. So Okay, so, so if you differentiate this function with respect to W, what is the gradient that you would get? It's basically minus XT, right? So I think there's a mistake in the notes. So this has to be W old plus eta times X and TN. The note says minus, it has to be plus because when you differentiate this, you also have a minus term. Okay, so now note, 
So we know that the magnitude of W doesn't matter, right? So for like it's like the magnitude of the W doesn't matter like in, in terms of classification, right? So Y of X is unchanged if we multiply W by a constant. Why? Because it doesn't matter. Like the value doesn't matter here. Like what matters is only the sign. If you if you remember the f function that we have for perceptron, okay. So you see that what matters is just the the sign of a, whether it is positive or negative. The magnitude doesn't matter, okay. So we are going to exploit that. Uh, oh, sorry. So we are going to exploit that and set eta is equal to one, okay. So we will set eta is equal to one, and hence this becomes w new is equal to w old plus xn tm. Okay, so there are some questions in the chat. I will come to that in a minute. Okay, so now that we know uh, the update rule, like we are going to write the perceptron algorithm, which is just the summary of what we have seen so far. Okay. So what we are going to do, we are going to initialize W randomly to begin with, okay? So then we are going to repeat until all data points are correctly classified. Okay, so what are we going to do? So we are going to go through the, we are doing stochastic gradient descent, right? Because we are going to go through the examples one by one. So for each, data point, let's just call it as X and TM. Okay, so what are we going to do? So if Y of XN is actually equal to equal to T of N, which means it's correctly classifying, then you do nothing. Okay, else W is equal to W plus X and TM, the gradient update rule. Okay, so I think that's it. So now this is my perceptron algorithm. Okay, so now remember that you're going to go through, if let's say we have 100 examples, we are going to go through all the 100 examples one after the other, right? So, so this is a for loop over all the examples, okay? Let me, and, and then you have this outer for loop, which is going to go through the example, the whole set again and again until the algorithm converges, right? So now remember that unlike like, Okay, so okay, so remember that like in this case, in every step, the error with respect to only one example is reduced, right? So it might actually affect the correctness of other examples. Let me give you an example. So let's go back to the illustration that we had. Yeah. So now for example, um, how do I give an extra example here? Um, Okay, maybe I will draw an example so that it's easier. Okay, so for example, let's say I have a problem like this. Okay, so now, yeah, okay, so now if I have to draw an ideal line, it would be, sorry, it would be something like this, right? So this is the classifier for these two uh, classes. Now, let us say I have, hmm, so I will also add something. Uh, well, I'm trying to construct, maybe I should have constructed this example before. Um, so let's say I have a line like this. Okay. So now, okay, now this is a good example. Okay, now let's say I want to correctly classify the cross. It has to come to the left of this figure, left of this at the boundary, okay? So now if I want to minimize this error, like I could come up with a line like this, okay? Now this second line, this is first line, this is second line. Now this second line actually makes correct prediction for X, right? But at the cost of introducing a new error, the circle has become cross now. 
right? So, so basically what I'm trying to say here is since it is a stoch pure stochastic gradient descent, like you might correct one example, but you might, that, that might make another example uh, like incorrect. So in every epoch, you are not guaranteed to reduce the total error. Sometimes the total error could go up because you made a wrong decision. Okay. Uh, okay. Now the question is like, will there be any situations where you would just keep on fluctuating between correcting, wrongly classifying, correctly, wrongly classifying uh, the problem, like the data set, right? Like, so like, or in other words, uh, will this algorithm converge? Okay. So yes, this algorithm will converge in certain situations. Okay. So which is explained by the perceptron convergence theorem. So I will just state the theorem. We are not going to discuss its proof. Okay. So if the data set is linearly separable, okay, if you have a linearly separable problem, then the perceptron learning algorithm, okay, is guaranteed to find an exact solution in finite number of steps. Okay, so what is the perceptron convergence theorem guarantees? It only guarantees that if the data set is linearly separable, then this algorithm will converge. Okay, so now there are a few like hidden aspects here, right? So it says it will converge in finite number of steps, but what is finite, right? And then the next problem is what if my data is not linearly separable, right? And also like what would be the quality of the solution that Perceptron is going to give me? So we are going to answer all these questions uh, in the rest of the lecture, uh, but maybe before that, let me take some questions. Is there any questions uh, people can raise hand and ask them now? Uh, there's just one question. What does linearly separable mean? Uh, okay, so maybe I could ask the same question back as a quiz. Uh, we have seen linearly separable and not linearly separable problems in the past. So, uh, okay, let I will just post this to the class. So, can someone raise your hand and explain what is a linearly separable problem? Any answers? Okay, so there are answers in the chat. So, okay. Uh, yeah, so you could divide the data, like you could classify by just, like perfectly by just using a linear decision boundary, right? That's a, those are, that is linear separable problem. Okay, so now let's actually look at an example of how uh, perceptron uh, would work, okay? So here is an example task, okay? Now in this case, let's start with the first figure. Here you can see that there's a black line which is trying to divide between the blue circles and red circles, okay? And the black arrow is pointing towards the red class, okay? Now you can see that, um, okay, now you can see that this one example, which was misclassified, uh, we, we are going to consider this particular red line. Maybe I use, let me use a different color. Uh, we are going to consider this particular red line. Okay, now there is an error, right? Now you do the gradient update. The gradient update is basically adding these two vectors, black vector and red vector. So you do an update and you move this line slightly to the right, right? So now this, the second time step is your result after the update. So now we are going to consider this particular red example, which is wrongly classified. Now you want to correctly classify it, right? So you move the line a little bit. So you keep on moving and at some point you would reach finally this particular classifier. 
which has all the reds to the arrow and all the blues to the left. Okay, now this is a very, very simple algorithm to implement. Like um, I would actually recommend you to try implementing perceptron with a very simple tie example like this and like understand the functionality even better. Okay, uh, okay, so there's a question. What do the arrows represent? Uh, well, the, the black arrow is basically the perpendicular to the decision boundary. Uh, and the red arrow is just the, the, the it is just the vector for uh, the particular example, the red, red example. And, uh, and I would maybe, maybe it's useful like if you can go recap um, the geometry of linear decision surfaces lecture, um, then it would be much easier, okay? How do you choose the start of the arrow? So you do that by random. So if you remember, if you look at this algorithm, you initialize W randomly. Once you have a random W, you're going to have a vector, like you have a plane and the corresponding par perpendicular vector, right? Okay. Uh, by defining the specific error function, the classification line is not going to be unique. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, Masa, do you want to maybe speak? You have to raise your hand. Uh, hello, sorry, uh, just a question. I mean, uh, by, uh, by, by, by least score uh, definition and maximum likelihood, we had just singularity, just one answer. But uh, with this server function, I think we have um, we have not a unique answer. We have yes. multiple. Oh, yeah. That okay, is on. a good point. So that is what we are going to start discussing now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. So let's actually get to that. Okay. So now, what are the issues with this algorithm? Okay. So for this lecture and next lecture, like we are just going to focus on the issues in this algorithm and like try to rectify those issues one by one. Okay. So the first issue is. The finite, the word finite in the convergence theorem, right? It's a finite number of steps, right? Can be very large. Okay. Especially if the gap between the classes is too small, then it is going to take a long time to find it. The smaller the gap, longer the time to find it. Okay, similarly, the issue rightly pointed out by Masood is like when the data is linearly separable, okay, then there are actually many solutions. And which one is found is actually dependent on the starting values. Okay, so to, to, I'll give you an example. Let's say I have something like this. Okay, if I actually start here, then I would stop when I find this line. Okay, now instead of doing this, if I start like this, then I would find this line. So now, See, both these lines have 100% accuracy. Now the question is, which is the best line, right? So both are good uh, in terms of training accuracy, which is the best line? So we have this problem, which is unanswered in perceptron. So there's another hand raised, but maybe let me just finish the issues. So there's also a third issue, which is basically when the data is not linearly separable, okay? In this case, the algorithm will not converge. Okay, someone asked this question, like how do I know if the data is linearly separable in high dimensional settings, right? Like, so now the, the problem is severe here because the algorithm will not converge and cycles will develop. Okay, you might have like really long cycle of going through the same changes to your classifier 
okay? And these cycles can be very hard to detect. So your algorithm will just keep on running. It is not going to stop. Okay, so now these are the issues with perceptron. So now the first question, like the first issue, we can't do much. Okay, so if the problem is hard, it is going to take more time. Okay, but the second and third issues can be resolved. Okay, um, at least for today's lecture, like we will try to resolve the second issue, which is basically if there are many, many solutions, like what is the right solution? What is the optimal solution, right? Like, and in the next lecture, we will try to answer the third issue, which is what can I do if the data is not linearly separable, okay? So to answer the second issue, we are going to discuss about like what is known as max margin classifiers. Uh, but before that, maybe I'll take Yomna's question. Don't raise your hand. Uh, okay, there was a hand raise. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, the answer was uh, given already. Okay, thank you. Okay, so to 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 resolve the first issue, we are going to consider max margin classifiers. Okay, what is the issue? If the data is linearly separable, okay, then the solution found by perceptron depends on one, the initial values of W and B, okay? Two, the order in which data points are presented. Okay, so there are many solutions. But what we are interested in is a solution which gives the smallest test error. Okay, now let's do this small exercise. Let's say I have a task like this. Okay, so now I'm going to draw three lines. Okay, this line, let's call it one. Now, this line, let's call it two this line, let's call it three. Okay, so now we are going to have a poll. I think for the first time after a long time, we are using all the three options in the poll. So we are going to have a poll. I want you to think and tell me which one of these three decision boundaries would you pick? Okay, so let me use a template poll. Uh, okay, the poll should be A. Please don't post in chat. So let's call this as A, B, C, okay? so. You can pick A or B or C. The poll starts. Okay, so maybe I'll stop the poll. Uh, okay, clearly 91% of you picked the B line, right? So why did you pick the B line? So now, well, anyone can answer in chat or by raising hand, like why did you pick B? Okay, so because, okay, there are some answers. Uh, People say this is the maximum margin. This is the most optimal line, right? Okay, so what, okay, maybe, okay, many of you say this is maximum margin, but why should I care about maximum margin? Like why, need, why do I need maximum margin? Any answers? <laughs> okay, so why do I, okay, so, okay, there are many answers. Okay, so why do I need maximum margin? Because Remember that our goal is not to get zero training error. Our goal is to get zero test error, right? So now I have no idea whether there's going to be a circle here or across here. I don't know, right? Like, so maybe, maybe once I see all the test data points, all these could be cross, in which case the C option is the best, right? Now, 
On the other hand, it might also be the case that I could see a lot of this thing here, right? So, so what, like, what is even worse is like, like you can imagine many many situations, right? So, so now we don't know what is there in that region. So, if you don't know what is there in the region, the most optimal thing to do is to be in the center, so that on an average you can do better. Okay, so that is why maximum margin is preferred. Okay, so now we are going to come up with a classifier which will find the maximum margin. Now to even do that is a bit involved. Like we need to first define the concept of mar margin mathematically. Okay, so so we will start with the idea of margin. Okay, so now what is margin? I'm going to define margin as the perpendicular distance between the decision boundary and the closest of the data points. Okay, so for example, let's say this is my decision boundary. Okay, and I have one data point here and I have another data point here. Okay. Now there may be other multiple data points here. Okay. Let's say, let's say this is my data set. Okay. Now margin is defined as the perpendicular distance between the closest data point and my decision boundary. In this case, the circle happens to be the closest. So now this is the margin. Okay. So now I can draw a parallel, sorry. Well, I'll try to draw a parallel line. Okay, I can draw a parallel line. Ah, I can draw a parallel, sorry. Well, let's just assume they're parallel. I'll draw a parallel, right? Okay, so now this is my margin. The same distance to the right and same distance to the left or top and bottom, okay? Okay, so now our goal is to find a decision boundary that minimizes this margin, okay? So the goal is to find the decision boundary that minimizes the margin. Okay, so now in this case, for this particular problem, okay, I'm going to erase my current decision boundary and let's see how, what would be the max margin classifier for this problem, right? So, well, I'm just doing it by mental reasoning, right? Like, so like mathematically, maybe the solution might be different, but the idea here is like, I would keep on moving this line, okay? Until I find a line where actually the distance between the circle class and the cross class is maximized, something like this. This would be the maximum, approximately this would be the max margin classifier. Is that clear? Can you mention that a minimized there, so can you call it? Uh, goal we want uh, to max? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, the goal is maximizing the margin, sorry. Well, since we are always doing minimizing, I put it minimizing. That maximizing, it's called max margin classifier. So maximizing the origin. Okay. So I think there were some hand raise. Uh, sorry, just a question about, uh, about the, um, the graph above. Yeah, the, the graph. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you know the circle, uh, the, 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 the circle. Then I said are are not sparse, but the the, the cross are uh, have some sparsity. Should we use? Oh, okay. C? So well, that was my. This is just an example, right? So maybe you could have oh, okay. similar Sorry. similar okay. things. So if okay. uh, just just if if the if we consider sparsity, should it be C the the best one because it's because the circle one. Uh, the oh, data. still no, still it is not C, right? Like you don't know, like X is pro, well, X is sparse, but still you could have an X here, right? Like what's wrong? We don't know. Oh, okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, but this is just a cartoon example. No, thank you. Okay, so now our goal is to find the decision boundary that maximizes the margin, right? 
Okay, so how do we do that? Um, okay, so now a quick reminder from chapter five of the lecture notes. I don't know which lecture it was. Um, and the reminder is, this is basically the geometry of linear decision boundaries lecture. So we have actually proved in that lecture that the perpendicular distance of a point x from a hyperplane defined by y of x is equal to zero, where y of x is given by w transpose phi of x plus b is given by y of x divided by w. Okay. Now this is something that we have already seen, right? Like, so if you want to know the perpendicular distance of any point from the decision boundary, uh, then this is exactly the equation for that. Okay. Now remember that we are only interested in solutions for which all the data points are correctly classified, right? So we are only interested in solutions for which all the data points are correctly classified, okay? Or in other words, I'm only interested in solutions where T of n, Y of xn is greater than zero for all n. Okay, so now the distance of a point xn to the decision boundary or decision surface is given by T of n multiplied by Y of xn divided by W. Okay, so I want so now this is the distance of x to the decision boundary. Now I could just expand what is y of xn, right? Like, so this is basically t of n, w transpose phi of xn plus b by w. Okay, so now I'm just going to formalize the function and then stop, okay? So now margin is, again, just as a reminder, margin is the perpendicular distance to the closest point from point xn from data set, right? So now I need to find the weight and bias, okay, by maximizing the margin. So arg max w comma b. I'm going to maximize the margin. Now what is the definition of margin? The definition of margin is minimum distance between the data point and the boundary, right? So, so it's going to be minimum over all possible examples. T of n, W transpose phi of xn plus b divided by w. Okay, so now you can see this w has nothing to do with the minimization problem, so I could take it out. So it becomes arg max of w comma b, one over w, minimum over all examples, T of n, W transpose phi of xn plus b. Did I do something wrong? Mm, no, I think I don't need that bracket. Okay. Okay, now this is my optimization problem. So what I have, what should I do? Like I want to find W and B, which maximizes the margin. But margin is not as simple thing as like the least square or negative log likelihood, right? Like so here in, it has another optimization problem inside. You need to find the minimum distance between the data point and the classifier, right? Like so you have a max outside, you have a min outside. This is actually a very complex optimization problem. So the direct solution Sharat, uh, why did you take T outside? I mean, it should be T should be outside, right? Which one? Uh, T of Y. So the back. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, okay. So maybe then I think there's a mistake in the notes again. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now the direct solution of this optimization function is very complex. Okay. So what we are going to do in the next lecture 
is to convert this into an easier optimization problem uh, by, by exploiting some facts here and solve the easy problem to find WNB. Okay, so now that is what we will do in the next lecture. And also once we solve this issue and once we have a way to do max margin classifier, then we will ask this, then we will try to rectify the last issue, which is basically how can I use this classifier in a, for a nonlinear least separable problem, right? Like, so like how can I make sure that the algorithm converges to not the ideal boundary because you, you cannot come up with a hundred percentage accurate linear decision boundary for a nonlinear problem. Uh, but there should be some least error linear decision boundary, right? Like, so we will attempt to answer that question uh, as well in the next lecture. Okay, so I will stop here. Uh, maybe, okay, so I'll take some questions, but before that, I highly recommend you to go either rewatch or go through the notes for this lecture um, so that uh, like you can easily follow uh, the next lecture. So this lecture and the next lecture are a bit more involved optimization. Um, like it's more useful like if you actually do a recap before coming to the next lecture. Okay, any questions? I'll just take a couple of questions and then stop the recording. Sharad, can we ask questions regarding the assignment? Um, okay, well, are there no questions regarding the lecture? <laughs> Like no one is hands. Oh, okay. So there is a question. Okay. So regarding the final exam, uh, I, okay. So I, well, it was a very hard thing for me to come up with a reasonable thing to do. And I think I eventually converged to having an online exam. So we are not going to replace the exam with, um, we are not going to replace the exam with assignment. Uh, also, I will not force you to come to the university to do the exam. Uh, we will do an online exam. But there is an exam, so study for the exam. So we are not canceling the exam. Uh, well, is, is it open book? Can you give me some more time to think about that? So it like I really spent a lot of time to figure out what should be the ideal mode, uh, whether online or physical. Uh, like I will give an I give more details about the exam in the near future. Uh, okay, dates. Okay, so dates for the exams are decided by the university. I think there is a specific. Well. I guess there's a specific slot for uh, this uh, exam uh, and we will be using the slot assigned by the university. And also remember that it's going to be a synchronized exam. So for people who are doing the course remotely, uh, like just make sure that you are, uh, you know the correct time the exam is and like you all will be taking the exam during the same time. Any other questions? Oh, okay, so regarding the final dates, well, um, I am as new as you to Polly, so maybe I will figure out the dates with the department and let you know. Uh, yes, for assignment two, uh, well, I think you have to use NumPy's multivariate normal to generate the data. <laughs> like, uh, I don't expect you to write a sampling function for Cauchy. Uh, well, when will be the exam? Yes, as I said, like I will find it and let you know. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording and then take more questions. <laughs>